So, you want to know more about Neolydians, or become one? I think I can help you. My name is Max, and today I will be the Pale Bird. If you don't already know, this is about Degenesis, a post-apocalyptic tabletop role-playing game and soon-to-be skirmishing <clears throat> tabletop role-playing game. Maybe role-playing. I don't know how to define it. If you'd like to learn more about the world itself, I would highly suggest you go over to the website as there's just so much there that I myself cannot sufficiently simplify. The world, as we know it, is gone. Humanity has survived dozens of grisly generations struggling for a better life amidst the end of Earth's civilizations. Various groups of people have carved themselves out a place and purpose within this blasted heath. It's not going to get easier. In the world of Degenesis Rebirth, there are organizations and societal structures that have found themselves in positions of power and influence across a variety of locales. This video series will give a basic overview of the world through the eyes of the 13 cults, hopefully giving you a better understanding of the cult, and maybe even an idea for a character or story of your own. Today is the Neolibians. When I first started playing and GMing to Genesis, I made the mistake of trying to explain this cult as Corpo Africans, or as like the Ferengi of Libya, or even as Neo-Neo-Colonial Conspiratorial Merchant Illuminati. It is much more than that. Life is tedious. And it's going to stay that way. Depending on where you may travel, you will encounter Neolibians. Either operating solo, with a entourage of sorts, maybe a Mansa Musa style caravan, or atop tanks. Anywhere there is profit to be made, there will be Neolibians attempting to do so. They come with the tide, the spring rain, the winter peace, or during auspicious phases of the moon. The city will be a buzz with the new magnates' arrivals. Cooks, tailors, furriers, merchants will quickly need to adapt to the influx of goods, the style of their new governing force, and if they're smart, study how they can be of use to this new overseer. That is how they will prosper in the new Olivian shadow. These learn, cunning, and sometimes ostentatious men and women are undoubtedly game changers wherever they may go. God is gold. Get that in your head. Sure, time is money, friend. No. Money is time. Power is wealth. Wealth that can be tangible, and that can be counted, clocked, or calculated in a quantity. It is energy to be exerted, carried, and then spent. In the lands of the lion, this power, money, is subservient to the higher ideals, the ancestors, the prides of warriors, the unifying aspects of life, fate, and death. An empty purse and a sense of pride is worth the purse. Neolibians do not need to live so religiously to attempt such ideals. We are bound by our culture, sure. We can act honorably. We are free from the more intangible ideals of man. This is most effectively seen when we ply our trade and our know-how. In the lands of the crow, every cult and clan has issues with one another and needs something. If a merchant refuses to sell, buy him out. If a hostile force is incoming, bribe them or bolster your own defenses with your treasury. Dismantle the factory, move it elsewhere, new and unable to be plundered. If a merchant opposes you, declares you their mercantile nemesis, have your children become friends. Offer to pay his progeny's tuition. Make an ally out of an enemy, and indebt their lineage to yours. Make an offer they cannot refuse. Now, let me tell you a story. But first, you are a guest in my home. I apologize. Some coffee. There once was a very poor merchant. This poor merchant was not having much wealth, but bountiful in mind. His life was coming to an end, and he needed a good future for his wife, his son, and his daughter, so that they can have many grandchildren and remember their father, their husband. So he comes up with a plan. He goes to the magnate of Benghazi, and he says, Dear magnate, won't you take my son into your service, as he is a, a brother-in-law to the great sailor prince? The magnate says, of course I will. He would be such a great addition to my court. Such good connections your family has. The poor merchant asks for the magnate, a small boat for my family to share the good news, receives it, and sails many days and nights to Syracuse, requesting an audience with the clanner king. He meets with the clanner king of Syracuse and says, my liege, I have brought you a ship 
to bolster your fleet and my daughter's hand in marriage to your famous prince. Her mother is a great ambassador of the Bank of Commerce. Such a daughter, she would make an excellent bride. The king says, of course, I've long wished to solidify the, the ties with the Bank of Commerce and find a suitable bride for my son. You must be well-spoken, as must be your daughter, as she comes from such stock. The poor merchant, he asks for a dowry. The king obliges, and they travel many days and nights to Tripoli. The poor merchant walks into the great temple bank and requests an audience with the consul assigned there, asks for his wife to become an ambassador between Tripoli, Benghazi, and Syracuse. She has many connections and family ties. Surely this would help cool any problems between the concessions. Knowing this, the consul agreed, yes. It would be helpful to have an ambassador in this triangle. One more could never hurt. Your wife has given birth to such accomplished children, and they must love her so dearly to keep such good ties with her. Your family is so refined and so close. Of course I will take your wife as an ambassador. I could ramble on about how this can't really happen, and what I'm trying to get to is that the point is that you can create wealth, sustenance, substance, from literally nothing. Or there's checks and balances to make sure that you can't make nothing or make something out of nothing. But you can. If you have the balls, if you have the brains, if you have the brawn, etc. Mm. Mm. Goodness gracious. Where won't there be the mercantile cult of cults? The wine purchased from beyond the Alps at a marked yet affordable increase when it was first purchased has found its way into Bassan. A more human moment between a Poliner scrapper and a Hebra Spaniard Neolibian who met in Pergar, they exchange their rifles and appreciate each other's craft. Gibraltar, one of the most important stops before engaging in the lands of the Crow. Merchant has stopped his financial crusade there and made one of the best hookah bars and hookah supply stores ever. You can see the smoke for miles at dusk. The known world is traversable for the higher uh, echelons and meritocrats of Neolibian society. They are, however, in many, many cases, urbanites, uh, paganos, pagani, and the conquerors of the world need charted seas and charted roads, places to be. Don't expect too many hermits who follow the example of the Libby. Maybe they'll just be a scribe. The vast majority of Neolibians exist in cities, towns that require bean counters, uh, managers for trade centers, for ports, ambassadorial quarters, a factory manager. There is no better hire. The web of a Neolibian brothers and half-sisters and kin allows for letters to be disseminated easily between them. The blood that flows red and cold penetrates and perpetuates intercult relationships. Mothers-in-law, adopted sons, become intertwined, intertangled between these mega-families of enterprise, entrepreneurs, and further exchange. The Sheikh couches one of the three rifles given to him for his birthday, as he addresses the conglomerate, the Zaibatsu, in front of him. He's built this company from the ground up over five decades, and over and over repeats, we're a family, both literally and figuratively. He looks over a crowd, maybe half of which is distantly related kin. No cult or guild can make the same long-lasting cause, have the same strategically economic mindset, or the power to grease any wheel, steering wheel for expeditions, grindstone for simple agriculture, or of course the wheels of war. Tactical, tactful, and most important, timely, New Libyans are a cult that started at the end of the war, and have grown through wise and careful investment. Their wealth only ever increases and they have the ability to make it quantifiable. Being a success is making your village, your community, Africa, your ancestors proud. Heck, one day you might even have your visage on a dinar, and then no one can really make the mistake of not knowing who you are. Dismissing a new Libyan without hearing them first will have serious repercussions. You have enemies, they have money. Not everyone has the ability to make it as a neo Libyan. Being a scribe is safe. Lots of busy work, you have a set skill, and you aren't necessarily taking gambles yourself. But if you're a merchant, you need a plan A and B. Safety nets, analysts, network, methods of communication. But remember, the Bank of Commerce does not bail out Neolibians who cannot dredge up collateral. 
The decadent and the stupid will have their new expedition be their last. The dawdling and the scared will miss their chance on an auction or a merger and will wither financially. Even the daring and self-assured will charge headfirst into a venture without considering the repercussions carefully. Don't be stupid. Be lucky. Develop a healthy sense of awareness. Paranoia, some might call it. Scourgers are the dogs of war that we can convince and call upon to battle. Nubians are the augurs that we can call upon for advice. Balance, the martial and the spiritual. Too much of the spirit blinds one to the material, of which we are good at. Too much of the martial will ruin any and all profit that is to be made. War is not nearly as good for business as peace is. Don't try to be either of these cults' friends. Point them, pave the road for them. They will prosper, and by coincidence, you will gain favor and profit. Donate to them. They may look down at you, beyond you, or sneer, but you will be better for it. Ego, unless spent in certain situations, will serve you very little. Look at Sevilla. Sevilla? Sevilla. The scourges have been let loose. Any and all diplomacy has been soured. The fields which were supposed to be invested in and seeded instead have become rife with landmines and lead. The people of Europe see the color of our skin and assume our presence heralds death and slavery, parasitic deals and cannibalism. That's a new one. Look at Constantine. Vain Neolibians sacrificed decades of struggle to have their faces printed on a coin. Sure, it might be neat, but is it really worth it? Look and listen to those stories of Crete. Supposedly, it's a treasure trove of ancient artifacts. But there are some places which will never be profitable. Don't fool yourself. Or some nomad northern barbarian will drink wine from your skull. Money cannot bring back the dead. Let us take a moment to appreciate the grand auction, the great equalizer, if you will, among any and all Neolibians. Fostering finance, aggressive, ambitious tactics, promoting healthy lending. This is the true essence of capitalism and cultivating capital itself. An underdeveloped region, mud huts, simple population, a complete lack of complex crops. In only a decade, this region can become a desirable place. A merchant takes their first steps into magnate hood by moving their family, their possessions, and their investments into this ho-dunk village. Year after year, they easily win the concession. No one wants it. No one wants to spend three months learning the culture, the dialect of this destitute place. Yet, a decade passes, the magnate now has silver hairs on their head. The children go gather taxes and tariffs for them. They make bank. Finally, the concession is worth something. If that magnate is smart, they can maintain their governorship. Uh, with support from a sheikh or a consul, by purchasing the concession and amalgamating the aging magnate in their new sphere of influence. Yet this magnate is bold. They want to keep the concession, and has married their lineage into the neighboring Neolibian and Clanner families. Not a sheikh, that will come, but a Neolibian of influence now. If he can hold on to this possession, he will prosper, and to an extent, everyone else in the region will. The region itself has been undoubtedly changed for decades to come. Hmm. Now, let us suppose the opposite. There was a concession, a land with rich soil, that has been experiencing a drought. The souls here suspects that this will last for quite a while, and no one would buy it without damning themselves. The drought will worsen. The curse that the souls here saw was the withdrawal of interest in this town. Business will need to move or suffer. Infrastructure cannot be maintained without the trade going in and out. Taxes slow to a crawl, and the population must move or resign themselves to their home, atrophying into a ghost town. It is an annual practice, one of much theater. There should be tickets sold to the battling czars of this bizarre bazaar of treaties and land titles. Remember, the concession is binding. Someone outbid your concession? It's theirs for a year, sure, but you cannot undermine it. If we reduce ourselves to our basest instincts, Neolibians would fight and kill off one another quite easily. That's what leopards do. We are lions. We look at the Neolibian rank tree. In German. It's a trident of sorts. The ability for one to create connections and diplomatic openings and even pursue great strange treasures will lead to advancement. There are many faux pas, taboos, and players who play a wholly different game in an area that you will need to keep in mind. 
If you can accrue ethical capital, you will succeed as a Neolibian. Monetarily, for sure, but connections, trust, and respect. Exploration leads to diplomacy. Diplomacy leads to trade, and trade yields wealth. You can attribute this to every interaction. Reconnaissance, gathering information, conducting introductions, making first contact, striking a deal or establishing terms. Those of whom are erudite can intern with scribes. Practice is an enumerator for some merchant or some senior Neolibian. Like with scrappers, this is a two-way relationship. The senior gains extra hands, extra eyes, and extra ideas by investing into the tutelage of their scion. It's business, business, marketing, synergy, business, profit. But there will be moments between you and your mentor where they will shed their cold, calculating fiat money exterior and show off the inner commodity of humanity. You have seafarers that own a shipping company. Goods need to cross the Mediterranean. Cartographers who analyze and assess maps and ledgers and the great hunters, potentially the most uh, flamboyant and liberal with their uses of investment and capital, the playboys of the Neolibian world, if you will, paving their way for more African investments. The magnates, the governors, managers, each dry dock of Syracuse probably needs a magnate of sorts. Shakes, the kings and queens, effective walking conglomerates and executives, the ability to turn the bank of commerce and the grand ship of the economy of Africa in certain directions. Everything must bow to this power. Scourgers, Anubians, and even hundreds-year-old traditions. Then, raiders. Colonizers, tried and true, establishing settlements and investing in colonies across the foreign and strange lands of Europe. Feeding the many independent cities and states within Africa, spreading culture and showing off the benefits of the cooperation with the wealthy land across the sea to the south. Ah, ambassadors, the couriers who possess tact and mindfulness, visit other nation states, other countries, and other African possessions, the ability to translate profit into poetry. Waziri, or viziers, the grand connectors, arbitrators of wealth, using precedence and logic to amass and move multiple millions of dinars over their lifetime. If sheikhs aren't mega-millionaires, the Waziri is able to dip his hands into the pockets of each and every one. Then, consuls, the New Libyans' organizational front line. Legally and literally, those who organize the New Libyans' power to maintain that power in the face of any opposition. The power within a city is within a consul. They don't necessarily own a concession for this trade lane or this city, but you don't want to replace them. They know this place better than any of its investors, either in the land of the crow or in the land of the lion. This cult is preserved by families. We already went over how easy it is to have connections with a brother or a sister-in-law. And truly, a Neolibian can come from anywhere. It just requires a good head on their shoulders. Say, a band of apocalyptics find a learned orphan, apprentice. A scrapper family has been told their newborn will become a Neolibian. Save up for his schooling, apprentice. Even a son of a Neolibian who wishes for his entire life to become a scourger. He'll understand in time, apprentice. A Neolibian isn't a gold-sick conquistador, or a African monetary-obsessed aristocrat, or even a sultan of sorts. They're people and they're human. Through age, and in skill, and in family, and in experience, you will grow. It is a very modern cult at the heart of it. So if one grows to eclipse the shine of gold where the bulk of your connections and trans transactions and projects outweigh the weight of dinars, you will have eventually reached the pinnacle of what it means to be a Neolibian, Neolibianess, not too dissimilar from the Libyan himself. You've reached a point where money doesn't matter. Your entire life, so far, it has meant everything. But the vast quantities that pass you by don't mean anything anymore. Fortunes lost, it's just a number. Concession value plummets, just a number. The time you spend on anything now is just a number. Gold is God. Now, God doesn't mean the same thing. If your energy and efforts do not need to be counted, if money doesn't matter, what would you do? Just because you can become a sheikh or a consul doesn't mean that you retire. You have duties and lofty grand designs to pursue. Cartographers, great hunters, money doesn't matter. Not the same way it once did. Waziri basically flow between the money. What would you do? What would you do? What would the Libyan do if money didn't matter? 
If time doesn't have a worth or its value surpasses its market value, what's the price of tedium? Busy work, the balancing of your checkbook. Don't do tedious things, hire someone else to. Adama has been an apprentice for the formative years of his life. He's begun to grow a patchy mustache and won't speak for too long, otherwise his voice will crack. He has been dutiful and attentive on every aspect. His half-sister's father took him under his wing, and they have sailed across the Mediterranean for more than four years. His education has been done by visiting ports on the onboard tutor Ifuza. Unbeknownst to Adama, his half-sister's father has made their next stop the Bank of Commerce for his rite of passage. His eyes glitter with each new city he visits. He has some of his African stock with him amongst his many more uh, southern Franken wares. Mull House has a merchant that Kurash can get deals from. But let's see. Nopelia needs some Franken wine. Liqua wanted silken textiles. Cathedral City can always use more ink for their illustrations. Now that if we look at the tariffs in the northernmost portion of the road between uh, Spicafield and Mobilis, we can beeline for Liqua at that corner. Not get into any trouble with those gimps. But that land is uncharted, and some people talk about limb eaters, body eaters. I don't know. It sounds like poppycock. If we make of it the multiple stuff, ah, Kurash will just charge the liquids more for their silk. Unblinking, serious, and utterly loyal, Yasmina serves Darweshi in Pergar. The scrappers of Bedain have made their way into the Adriatic to look for the wrecks of shri ships near the coast. She has informed the Adriani of their expedition, the Lombardi, to ensure that no trade lanes are blocked, and the Romanos to see if they want to lend some manpower towards the hunt. Each has been warned about the other two's potential machinations. Diplomacy can absolutely be a dagger in the back. Maya and Yasmina now has enough scourgers to throw her weight around, and a good start to a bidding war. Charts and logs fill Inorita's office. A quarter of the scribes that she has in her employ are statisticians. She pays merchants and scrappers for information, reports, and numbers. She has a solid connection with the nearby Ibis, and direct links to just about every coastal city in North Africa. Inorita has been able to put together as close to a census as any other has attempted. There's another scribe somewhere in Marrakesh that she might be able to get the inland version of this together. Sheikhs would pay handsomely, but Inorita works for a waziri and the Bank of Commerce itself. Cartagena should be re-looked at. And in the Alps, who was that, Tishinguta? But he was exonerated. That's one less Helvetic problem. The Black Sovereign, the Trois du Mela, may need another evaluation. Lugal Zugesi knows the ways of the lion, and dabbles in that of the leopard. When war in Hebra Spania was on the rise, he would find plenty of places for scourgers to die. His associated vultures would pick up the sacred African firearms and sell them to Guerreros. These deals have been concealed through loyal scribes, strange and exotic art dealings, and a laundry room or two. Sending those meathead scourgers to find honor makes Lugal Zagesi very wealthy. He has been brought to trial for his strange concessions three times, but the sextet of Neolibians have always seen his way. Some are Neolibians because that is how they were raised, and they have a knack for numbers, networking, business, charisma. Many are born into the family business, needing to fulfill the expectation, or else, while others are taken from small villages for their prowess in mathematics to live their life as a scribe, and others become a Neolibian because their village needs a hero in the form of a bean counter. The spiritual component of the Triumvirate of Africa ignores our promises and use, while the Claws of Africa refuse to understand the logic, the logistics, and the fuel that feeds their fires. And the Land of the Crow is filled with those who could become great if only they had the opportunities and the skills. Cliners fill our workshops. Each cult has held our coins not wanting to let go. Chroniclers pretend to have our power, and every faith on Earth attempts to rise beyond the Great Uniter. Value. A work day has passed. No one would blame you for staying a little longer at the hookah bar post-business venture, or finding the warm embrace of a concert, or speaking on a closer level with Warui, or in the lands of the crow, 
Muse. That could work, too. Keep that uh, calculator close. An abacus, maybe. Don't let ennui tear you away from financial awareness. Balance that checkbook. It'll be boring, but still. And make sure that you have the blessing of a soul seer. And no matter what, do not betray your patrons. Whether it's for your new campaign, or a character, or even just a thought experiment, I... experiment? I hope I have helped set a frame of mind, establishing and then destroying what it means to be a new Libyan. I know this was a lot. Take your time. If you want to read directly from the source, Primal Punk, Catharsis, that's usually the way to do it. Afri or, or, Af or Africus. Artifacts. In thy blood. Specifically for Black Tom. But the killing game, a little bit of Black Atlantic. The killing game is the bread and butter of Neolibian everything. Just the, 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 in the mindset of the networking. It's all free. But if you want to focus on just the Neolibians, I have a couple suggestions. Uh, initiation, it's in artifacts. I'm fascinated with rites of passages, period. And so like a financial business one is even very alien and strange to me. I dig. Scourge. Excuse me, Surge Tank, sick, is absolutely gives off the Mansa Musa vibe that I hope you and whatever Neo Libyan you have will achieve. But my favorite has to be the biography of the African in Malach, who is just utterly a businessman. And like, it is, that is just him. It very, like a one dimension character, but like the best pinnacle. Um, yeah, they're down below. So keep in mind, for Neo Libyan, but in all things. I have to read this, otherwise I'll sing it. How then am I so different from the first men through this way? Like them, I left a settled life, I threw it all away. To seek a northwest passage at the call of many men. To find there but the road back home again. I hope you have a wonderful, beautiful, awesome, just good day. Huh. Oh, that's too cold. That's not good cold. Ah, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage. Let me tell you a story. And, pardon me, where are my manners? This is absurd. You are a guest. Come now. There's a hole in my pot.